Dr. Rodriguez would normally be here to introduce our wonderful new guest, but he is at a chairs meeting. Um, and so, uh, so it falls on me to introduce uh, uh, Ivan, who is with us from UNAM, which is the um, main university in uh, San Jose, yeah? It's near to San Jose. Near yes. San Jose, okay, yeah. near San Jose. So, um, so, an, so fantastic expert in large animals. So our title is Environmental Science and Resource Management, right? Our department. That name comes from uh, the folks that founded or thought about creating this program, of blending these two dis what are, have historically been viewed as disparate trends. Environmental science, which is normally things like water quality and measurements, that kind of stuff, and resource management, which is traditionally things like big game management, predator management, stuff like that. And so Yvonne falls squarely in that tradition, but as a great scientist, he's spread out. So he's, he used to work on, on, on large felines, now he works on crocodiles and everything. And a great example, I think, of how when you learn these fundamental concepts and you have really good, solid preparation, you can do a whole bunch of stuff. You can continue to do what you've been prepared for, or you can actually grow and morph and evolve and explore different topics. And things like conservation biology, things like resource management often require us to sort of become a crab and go sideways sometimes and take on new tasks and, and try to uh, look at things in new ways to solve challenges. And so um, with that, maybe not a great introduction, <laughs> uh, uh, Dr. Sandoval will tell us about um, some, what we're we, we learning about um, conservation stuff in Costa Rica. Sounds great. All right. Very good. Okay. So I'm a wildlife biologist. I, as Sean said, I work with crocodiles. I have almost eight years working with crocodiles. And I started 20 years ago. Well, my first job was a uh, National Geographic project assistant with crocodiles. Because. Oh, well, your very first one? Yeah. Oh, and oh, that oh. was really exciting for a Costa Rican <laughs> and to work with uh, an enterprise as, as National Geographic. So. I worked with them for a couple of years, and then I went to study, I did my masters, and I started to work with jaguars in Costa Rica. The thing is that Costa Rica is so small that we have problems for conservation, even when we have the 25% of our country under uh, some kind of protection. So did you think that 25% is a lot of your whole country. But in 2010, we started to think that that may be a problem, and we are going to see why. So we started to do some basic things that you maybe already know in GIS. We tried to measure the size, the shape, and the forest coverage in and out the, the protected areas. Why? Because even with a 25% of our country under any protection, we, we were thinking that we could have problems. So we'll start like yesterday. Basically, you know what is fragmentation? Is one of the main causes of ex uh, extinction. And basically, the size and the shape and the forest coverage are going to determine who is be able to live in one place or another. There are species that are really happy in a disturbed area, and there are some species that live in really conserved areas. So we, tried to, we started to think that way. and. Basically, we come up with the idea that the fragmentation is a process in which big areas become smaller. That's it. That's and that, had, that leads to a lot of species of uh, natural habitats and biodiversity. So it's like that. You have something really big, and it started to reduce its shape and, well, its its size and this, the shape is going to vary it too. So the thing is, you have to think about the size in a manner in which you are 
thinking in some kind of a species that may or may not be able to live a place like that. For example, if you have a square, well, w what it would be better for conservation, a circle or, or a square? Why? What else? Think about core areas. Think about uh, exposure of the matrix around. What else? And let's think about a shape as a star. What could be better? A star, square, or circle? some basic things that you already know. So we were thinking in that way. So we basically, well, in Costa Rica, we have a big problem. During the 60s and the 80s, we lost almost 80% of, of, of our forest coverage because of um, a government politics. We were exporting cows, meat, to here, to United States. And you're, wel you're welcome. <laughs> it, it was related with the Vietnam War. Oh, really? Yeah, to send meat, to send hamburgers. So the importation of meat was huh. extremely enormous. Huh. So we have support from the U.S. government to have cattle, and every single one who has a piece of land cut the forest hmm. and started to have cattle. And we lost almost 80% of, of our forest coverage. That obviously had a, a really big impact in isolation, fragmentation, and the diminish of the forest areas. You're practicing Spanish, right? <laughs> okay. And that's what happened. This is 1940, and you can see what happened <coughs> in 87. What was remaining was basically what we called a national park. That was it. Everything outside of the national park was cut down. So can you imagine the consequences that that action could have? So early 70s, a bunch of Costa Rican visionaries that study outside of Costa Rica, of course, <coughs> had a different perspective. And they said, like, we should do something. And they started to establish protected areas. But they did it without a plan. It was like, OK, there is a forest patch over there. Well, we're going to conserve it. Uh, where is another one? OK. Is another one uh, in here? Well, we have to conserve it. But they never thought about, is it a, a good place to, to conserve? Is the size and the shape good for conservation? They just did it to preserve what was left. So. Right now, Costa Rica has more than 25% of er, the territory under any category of protection. We have national park, biological reserves. We have something that is called absolute natural reserve. We have national wildlife refuges, wetlands, protected areas, forest reserves, state farms, and each of this category has different, different objectives. In this one, you can have anyone living inside. Okay, You can have anything living in a national park, situation that is different than in most of the country. The same thing here and here. But here, you can have conservation activities and people living on the, on the, on the refugees. Uh, the same thing with wetlands and protected areas and the other categories. So this is a Costa Rica map, and those are 
the different protected areas. It seems that it's a lot, right? But look at the size. Look at the size and the shape of many of them. And if you see, look the scale. Well, this scale, well, actually, it is correct. So the protected areas are really, really, really small. So, for example, to ensure the population of Jaguar in a hundred years, we have to have at least five, or 100 reproductive animals without the juveniles and the, the small ones. And in here, that is the Corcoado National Park. This is one of the most important parks for the Jaguar conservation in Costa Rica. We have, or, uh, how many do you think are Jaguars are in, in Corcovado National Park. Give me a number. Any number. <laughs> 150? Okay. 200? 500? 85. 85? 50. We have 50 in all the peninsula. But wow. just in Corcovado National Park, we have count maybe 26 to 30. 36. Wow. What that means? that we may lose, that we are going to lose the Jaguar population in Costa Rica if we don't do something right now. And why we just have 26? Because there is not more space for, for any of, for more of, of more, for more Jaguar, actually. The size is very, 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 very small. So, That leads us into a problem. Besides, well, thinking about the size, we have to think about another problem. And that problem is that what is surrounding the national parks, it's a different type of coverage. So you cannot think that the animal could walk outside of the park and is going to be in a, a similar environment. It's completely different. And that obviously, obviously give us the idea that isolation and not the continuity on the, on the forest coverage, what lead us into a problem for the animals that have to move and disperse and look for feed supplies or something to, to eat, and that it may be looking for a, for a female for reproduction. So that's complicated. So we already know that that type of situation are, are going to affect the wildlife behavior and the ecology of this. Basically because that characteristics, that characteristics are determined by the size, the shape, the density, and the degree of continuity between the different type of coverage. Right now, every single Costa Rica protected area, it's like managed because of the fragmentation project mm -hmm. uh, problems. So what did we do? We, we use basic GIS metrics to try to figure it out what would happen in Costa Rica, what is happening in Costa Rica. So we just did a, a we measured, well, we take a look of the size we take a look of the shape, and we took a look of the isolation between the protected areas. And we analyze the different uh, strategies that our government is implementing to reduce that problems. And that is 
uh, well, the main objective of the main activities that they are planning is to build corridors, as in any other country, basically. To try to unify the type of coverage and give the animals the opportunity to move around the different places. So we measure the fractal dimension. What is a fractal dimension? Do you know what fractal dimension is? Okay, a fractal dimension is a measure of the shape. Something that is really <coughs> fractal, it will be a star with a lot of peaks and things. It is not geometrical, it is not compact, okay? That is something fractal. And we already know that something that is really fractal, it is not going to be good for conservation because of the edge, because of the reduction of the core areas, because of the different situation that happened in a, in a protected area that could have that a uh, complexity. We made the main shape index that measured kind of the same. We measured the, okay, let's see. The fractal dimension has values that varies between one and two. Being one, like geometric forms. So a square, a circle is going to be near to one. And two, it is going to be a fractal form. That means that something that has a value near to a two, it's going to be like a star, something very irregular. The main shape index measure the shape to basically zero, it would be a geometrical form, and more than one, it's going to be a, compl a complex form. We measure the perimetral index. The perimetral index gives us the idea of the exposure that a protected area could have. So, can I borrow this? What has more exposure, this or this? This one? Yeah. Why? It's basically, but what is better for conservation? More exposure or less exposure? Hmm? More. More exposure because it will mean that you have a bigger area. So we have to think that way. Yeah. Very good. And we measure the mean nearest neighbor to see the distance between the, the protected areas, basically. <coughs> Some basic GIS things. This is really, really basic, but with a, a framework of ecological uh, thinking in, are really important. So, and we measure the forest coverage inside of the protected areas, outside of it, and on the natural corridors or the biological corridors. What we, what we found, we basically found that the national parks are the bigger ones, but knowing that, we look at, at, the, at the size and it's really small. So within all the categories, we have something that is big, but in a matter of a scale, it is really, really, really small. Because if you can see, Costa Rica is this size, California is this size, just California. So for us in a map, it looks like okay, but actually if we see it in a context, it is going to be really small. Then we knew that the indigenous reserve, that is a category in which people can live we have the indexes of shape with the higher values. That means that the shapes are not complex, okay? We measured the fractal dimension and we found out that the value was really close to one. 
Do you have an idea why? That means that the shape tends to be geometrical. Why? I could imagine that for me at the beginning, I would think, I would say that it has to be different. <coughs> for me, the idea was that the value has to tend to uh, the fractality. <laughs> but why is close to the geometrical forms? Okay, the idea is guys, that's why? That's something to do with the people who are cutting down the forest around them. Their properties are already divided up into really We are seeing just geometry. the shape, not the forest coverage right now. We are seeing the boundary. That's it. People still need to get lines, roads. Great. How, what is better for a topographer to register, re register something that is an a square or something that is really irregular? Uh, and a square. It is going to be just four lines. One, two, three, <coughs> and four. That's it. Rather than have something that is like, right? So when we thought about it, we come up with that idea. It's just because um, I think of registered the properties, to sign the properties into the institution that rules that, okay, in Costa Rica. I don't know what is the name here. We found out that this is important. These are wetlands. Wetlands is mm. a category that we have under protection that is really unique and has a specific characteristic and there is a lot of species that depend on the wetlands. And we found out that the wetlands has the more complex shapes. Mm. And they are really, really small. And basically, we have wetlands on the coast because <coughs> when we said wetlands, we have to think about mangroves. How is the shape of, of a mangrove? Is it like a square? Is it like a circle? How is the shape of a mangrove? Where is the mangrove? It's an estuary, where are the estuaries? By the coast, and are the estuaries like a compact form, or are like, like lines that are by the coast? It's like a line. Littoral, excellent, yeah. good word. And what does this mean? That just because of the characteristics of the wetlands, naturally, they are going to tend to a complex form. And that naturally is going to tend to give the, to the wetlands like more exposure because it's a line along the coast. It's going to have less core areas it is going to have a, a lot of pressure outside of it. And let's see, let's going to use a Costa Rica example. Why, well, I'm going to ask you something different. <laughs> Why is Costa Rica a good place to visit? You said one, excuse me, what, what's your name? Why did your brother went to Costa Rica? Surfing trips. Okay, surfing trips. Surfing. Church. What else? Biodiversity. Biodiversity? Mm -hmm. What else? Good coffee. Good job. I guess that the coffee is not the main <laughs> reason to go <laughs> to Costa Rica. <laughs> Actually, when, when, when is the best time to go to Costa Rica? Yes. 
I'm going to put it in another way. When is the best time to live here and go to Costa Rica? <laughs> okay, winter, right? So what's the main reason to go to Costa Rica? The temperature. Weather. Weather. We have high seasons when you all guys go to Costa Rica and it's running away of the cold, of the snow, okay? So, where are you going? Where, where will you go in Costa Rica? Are you, will you stay at the, at the Central Valley where there is not ocean around, where there's a lot of pollution, <laughs> a lot of cars, <laughs> a lot of traffic? No? Where? Yes, exactly. So, where are you going to stay? Hmm? Yeah, you, you, you are going to make a camp or something like that? A tent? I don't think so. Most of you go to a hotel, okay? Where's the hotel? Okay, if the hotel is really near to the ocean, that will be better or no? Better, better yes. Better. If, if you are going to make a reservation and the hotel says, the description says, it's two miles from the coast, go join us. We're going to give you the surfboard. You can imagine yourself with the surfboard, two miles. <laughs> <laughs> no. So, we already know that you are going to go to a hotel, that it'll be better if it is really, really close to the beach. And I al we already said that the mangroves are on the same place. Mm -hmm. So in Costa Rica, we're having big problems with the pressure of the tourist expansion. So naturally, we just said that the wetlands are like with a really great, exp well, a great exposure and has problems of, of conservation <coughs> just because of the shape, the natural shape. And if you can imagine a lot of guys trying to cut down the, <laughs> the mangrove and fill it with sand or whatever to build an hotel, you're going to come up with an idea of the difficulties that the mangroves have now in Costa Rica. What else? The Ming nearest neighbor, okay? The most important protected areas in Costa Rica are the national parks. Look at the distance between national parks. It's more than 10 kilometers. Do you think that a frog can walk 10 kilometers to go to one place to another? It is going to be a jaguar able to do it? Maybe walk 10 kilometers for a jaguar, it's different, but we're going to see what happened with the corridors. Okay, so that's the protected areas. Look at the size of the wetlands. Look, everything. This is a wetland, this is a wetland, this is a wetland, this is a wetland. This is where is Nash, uh, Las Baulas National Parks. So for the ones that are going to Costa Rica, you can to go and look for a map and you are going to see the park over here. And this is protected areas as national parks. The green ones are the national parks. But so the thing is, naturally, the wetlands are losing and we have a lot of pressure on, pressure on it. We'll see. What's the strategy that they are using? They are trying to build <coughs> corridors. All the black thing is a corridor. And I put it in black just for one reason. For me, this strategy has a black future. <laughs> That's the truth. That's the truth. And why? It looks like it's a good option. And if you can see, we have two paradigms here. One is the net type of corridors that are on the peninsula. And the other one is the complex shapes and forms and the big, well, for our scale, 
big corridor, okay? So, we did that and we said, okay, there is an option. We, everything is not lost. And then we started to <laughs> think and we said, okay, the corridors are on private land, mm -hmm. are not from the state, okay? So, we said, look, we're going to measure the amount of roads and towns. And look, every single red triangle, it's a town. And obviously, the lines are roads. Do you think that any animal is going to be able to cross all that matrix? No. But the animal may try, there is going to be poaching, there is going to be illegal hunting, and there is going to be a lot of problems with agriculture. What, why an animal that is dispersing could give an, well, someone problems with agriculture? Let's imagine the, they are cropping corn, or beans, or whatever. The animal is going to move, and is going to eat the agricultural things that they are cropping. So the thing is, the animal may not be a problem for them, but we think that it is going to. So if an animal is giving you a hard time, what is going to happen? You are going to kill the animal. So that is what is being happening right now. And we made, like, we measured the buffer areas. We measured a kilometer, we, we did a, a kilometer buffer of each uh, protected areas. And we noticed this. If you can see, this is the protected area, this is corridors, and this is the buffer area. Inside or within the corridors, we have 50, almost 55% of activities that are not good for conservation, like agriculture and non-forestal things. If you do the math, you're going to see that more than 55% or almost 55% is not good for conservation. And if we and if we did that to for the buffer areas, and we find out that just around the protected areas, 52 percent are not good of the conservation of the coverage, forest coverage of the land use is not good for conservation. We found out more than 1,500 towns inside of the, of the corridors. Each town could have to a hundred to a thousand hunting. So, and we measured that in average, we have almost 20 kilometers of roads inside, in average, inside each corridor. So, could this be a good conservation strategy? What can we do in Costa Rica? What are the main issues that you are seeing with this kind of this type of, of strategies? What could we do? You are the experts. <laughs> Tell us. Developing country. You are in a great so rich. We're super rich, yeah. you guys. We have all the answers. Help us. How? What can we do? Use tourist money to help um, for that generated from eco tourism to subsidize you, you, farmers you, and to move okay. another way to make corridors. What's your name? Greg. Greg, let's imagine that your family owns a hotel in Costa Rica. Are you willing to give 50% of your earn? 
to us just to protect the land. Greg loves nature. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Are you father enough? But a, a small farm, if they can be relocated, you know, and be subsidized through tourist income, not pay out to, to move it. Okay, that's one option. What else? What else? What can we do? We have to ensure the persistence of the species. We have to ensure to have jaguars. We have to ensure to have pumas. We have to ensure to have crocodiles, frogs, birds, harpy eagles. What can we do? What else? Options. Basically, ensure uh, that you guys have those kinds of species within the park, or just to have those species. Because you guys well, create, like, the features. animals are within the parks, but they have to move. There is enough a a space to have more that can ensure that it is going to th that the po populations are going to remain in time. So we have to come up with some ideas. We have to do something to ensure that the animals could move around, could read, could have a partner, could uh, start the, the well, could finish the life cycle. And to do all that, you have to have a lot of space to ensure that the animals can do all the activities inside of its home range. So sometimes they are going to be there, and some other time they are going to be around there. But they need the space. But if we don't have enough space, obviously the animal is going to die. So we have one option. It's Greg's option. What else? What are you doing here? Because you have the same problem in a different scale. OK. Here. Um, so you could tell them that uh, to give you guys money so that way you can find more areas to protect the animals too, so that way they don't encroach so much on the where they have visitors and uh, tourists. And then also let them know that the tourists come because they want to be I'm going to give you an example in a minute. I don't know if it's in Costa Rica, but I know that some corridors build like ladders, like tree trunk ladders. Yeah, but this uh, that is for for Tourist some animals. specific species that can have to move mm -hmm. and have to cross the streets or some space that could be dangerous. example that I was saying that I, I, I should give you is, okay, yesterday I, I kind of, uh, we discussed the problems that we have with crocodiles now in Costa Rica. <laughs> One of the main problems is that the crocodile population is growing due to the protection that the law is giving to the crocodile. So the population in some parts of Costa Rica has tripled, passing for like four animals to almost 10 animals per kilometer. And a couple of months ago, we have an accident in Las Baulas National Park, the place that we are going to visit in January. And that accident happened because a tourist was swimming on the estuary. And the crocodile practically cut the head off, yeah. well, the, the leg off. So the option that every tour <coughs> operator gave was kill the animal. So 
we said no. We have we are in a in a committee of crocodile specialists in Costa Rica, and our recommendation was okay, catch the animal and release it some other place. But you have to ensure that the animal doesn't have the behavior mixed up. And what I meant, wh what I meant of mixed up is that people now eat. Well, the tourist guides are feeding the crocodiles. So the crocodiles are associating human presence with, with food. So they, the normal behavior was that if a crocodile were over, maybe over there, and see you, he, he moves. He, he's not looking for a conflict. He will avoid you. But right now, the behavior is that if the, if the crocodile see you, it is going to approach to you. And you know what that is happening? Because of money, because of the tips. So there is not a consciousness among a lot of the population that could lead us to a, an strategy in which we can like think that everybody is going to do the, a good thing. So your idea is a very good idea, and not everybody, but not everybody is going to, well, give their earnings to, <laughs> to conservation. <laughs> and besides that, we are a small country, and we don't have enough space to do that. So look at this. Look at the amount of towns that we have. We have people living on the corridor. They live in a very poor way sometimes, so they need poach, some of them. Is it possible to relocate these people that live in the corridors? It could be an option, but we don't have the money or the space to do it. Okay, I'm going to relocate <coughs> someone. Did you say people, right? No animals. Yes. Okay. I could take someone from here, and we are going to move this family. Look, San Jose is full of people. <laughs> we don't have enough space. What, what I'm saying with this is that you are facing the same problem, but with a different scale and, and a different framework and in a different frame time. You are going to leave the same things here. And the same things are happening with the mountain lions, as Sean mentioned it yesterday. And I guess with a lot of other species. The thing is that, yes, we, we have to do something. But the main objective of this presentation is to tell you a couple of, of things. One is. GIS is really important to show <laughs> why and a scale ma the scale matters that they give a wider perception it would le uh, lead us to know how the different uh, processes on the wildlife is going to be affected and that you don't have to do very advanced things to have conclu good conclusion. This is really, really simple. And that's the idea of why I choose this to present, <coughs> uh, to present it here. But let's see what else is here. I have a question. Yes. How is the uh, laws against poaching in Costa Rica? Does alligators and um, we have crocodiles? Oh, crocodiles. Yeah. I'm sorry. Remember, it's salt. We have we have alligators. Oh, we okay. have alligators. Okay. So there crocodiles is, and yeah. the is it cougar? Or, sorry. Jaguars. 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 Do they have the same amount of protection, or one has better protection than the other? It depends on. Well, that's a good question. Actually, you can have protection due to the pro to the laws of the country, or you can have some species that are on the law of the country and in in an in international like agreements like UCN 
for cystitis. <coughs> so jaguars and crocodiles has the same have the same uh, protection because are declared as an endangered species and are included on this in CITES and UCL. But there are a lot of species that are with reduced population and they said they had less concern, for example, peccaries in some places. But, but yes, basically <coughs> we have a big list of endangered species, but that is not <coughs> like a criteria to say that if you have this species under the protection, people is going to respect that. If you have kids and you don't have anything to eat, you are going to poach. If you had a problem with your house, you are going to cut down the, 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 the tree and you are going to <coughs> the, you're going to fix your house with that. So it's a matter of, of needs. And I'm not justifying to kill the animals or to cut the tree, mm -hmm. but it is something about um, humanity that you have to think sometimes. You may be, well, people maybe do something, maybe do something that is against the law, but sometimes it's because they need it. And I, I want to say that again, I'm not justifying to do that kind of things. But yes, so it's a matter of a scale. Could we use this example <coughs> to give some answers to the problem with the mountain lions here? What is happening with the, with the habitat of the mountain lion? What the, why the population is growing? Why I, are they closer and closer of the urban areas? You are going to manage, most of you are going to manage these species. So why? What, why are they close to people? Food? What are they eating? Pets? Deer mostly. Deer mostly in California. Okay. And where are the deers? In the backyard garden. Yep. Why? Nice and green. <laughs> One place with water in California. Right now. <laughs> uh, I was kind of thinking like they're getting closer to the urban areas, but it's not that they're getting closer, it's like we're invading their space. Yeah. Great. That's an excellent point of view. And if you remember, we have a lot of people living in the surrounding places of the national park. And in Costa Rica, that you could associate la uh, the, the lack of, of money or, or opportunities to places that are really close to the national parks because there is nothing around. So just really cool people live there, okay? So at the end, you can say that the Costa Rican protected areas tend to a geometrical forms, and we, we already discussed why. You can say that the protected areas or the surrounding areas of the protected areas in Costa Rica have problems and it is going to reduce the possibilities to the animals to move to other place. You can say that this, the shape and the forms could affect the establishment of certain groups. Unfortunately, rather than the national parks that, that have a, 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 let's say, bigger size, the other protected areas are really, really, and I meant really small. The corridors are a good strategy, but, but the corridors have 
a lot of negative things that I personally think that are not going to be the solution for the conservation and the wildlife in Costa Rica. When, you, when we discussed about the buffer, we saw that what is on the buffer is different from the national parks forest coverage. And that is something that is going to affect the populations. So that's basically it. I don't know if you have questions, comments. That was made six years ago. So what's new? What can we do different? What improvements can you do with this type of analysis? You're in a GIS class. Well, these guys are conservation biology, but but yeah, but many of them taking con taking GIS or will take GIS. I, you know, I have a a GIS class with a GIS English program, hmm. and I was not a uh, English speaker. I'm still not. <laughs> so <laughs> the thing is, what could we do different? <coughs> could we apply this model? to this area. Yes? The same? Should we measure something different? Should we include another variable in here, like water supplies, like type of coverage, like agricultural activities? Land, like use, land use overlays, maybe? What's mm -hmm. permitted in certain areas? OK, yes. Pesticides, pollution, sources of what else? What should we have to include in, a, in an analysis for these areas? Which are the key species to analyze? Which one? The mountain lion is, 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 it, is it one? Is it the most important? Mm -hmm. I, I'm going to say something. I, I don't know the right. Do you have birds? Do you have? So our wildlife corridor monitoring primarily uses terrestrial vertebrates. Yeah. So mostly we're parametizing stuff with mountain lions and uh, coyotes and bobcats mm -hmm. and uh, you know the sexy things that everybody likes to see, but also deer, uh, American badger. Um, Trying to think of what else. Maybe maybe raccoon. I don't think raccoon is in the current model, but those kind of things. It's but raccoon, it's a key species to to analyze because of its behavior. We have now in Costa Rica a big problem with raccoons and coatis at the Central Valley. That is the place in which the people live. We have sixty percent of the Costa Rican population living on the Central Valley, and they are having problems with raccoons and coatis. What do you think that is happening? Why? High urban population. Yeah? So Food supplies. Mm -hmm. You already mentioned it. OK? And what's the main problem with have <coughs> raccoons and quatis near to an urban area? Trash, yeah? What else? What else? Diseases? Diseases? Rabies. Rabies? What else? Fleas. Mm. Like, I don't know the name of the, all the small fleas. things yeah, in yeah. English. Fleas and ticks. Yeah, yeah. Fleas, and, uh, fleas and ticks. So it's a problem. And you are going to have the same problem here. And you are going to be managing all these animals. So any other question, any other things that you would like to share with with me, maybe, because I can repeat this with <laughs> variables. What could we do in Costa Rica? So one thing we have well funded that maybe isn't as well funded in Costa Rica is, is planning, even though you guys will be surprised at this. <coughs> so we have, for example, Ventura County, um, you know, 
30 year out plan for what, what the county, where the county wants to expand roads, where they want to uh, expand housing developments and things like that. So you could overlay that, those forward projections. Not that we're necessarily gonna do that exactly, but that would give you a sense of forward looking. Since this is mostly back, current slash backward looking as to what the current impacts are. So you could, you could use some data layers to try to forward cast what the challenges might be 20 years from now. And that might, that might constrain your options. You might say, oh my God, everybody says we're gonna widen the road here, so maybe that's not a place to put the corridor. Or vice versa, maybe say, oh my God, this is gonna be an incredibly important pinch point and everybody wants to develop here, so we should very, very much so focus on the corridor there. And that's what's that's one of the things that's happened at Liberty. Did Dr. Steele talk to you guys about wildlife crossings and stuff yet? Yeah. Okay. Did you talk about Liberty Corridor? So Liberty Canyon is the big pinch point where the mountain lions want, or, or wildlife most typically goes from the Santa Monicas into the more inland mountains, and so that's become the focus of a lot of different nonprofits, national park, all these folks. And so that's an example of looking, using forward planning and saying, hey, where are pinch points and everywhere else is gonna get developed. This is a place that we might have half a chance at, at augmenting connectivity. And so that's, so that's an example of using that forward casting to try to. You know, a couple of years ago, I made a landscape potential habitat for jaguar in Costa Rica. And that is on this kind of thinking Jaguar is a sexy species, basically. <laughs> it's different to try to get a grant for jaguars to try to get a grant for a crocodile or a snake <laughs> or something right, like that. Right, because right. it is not, th these last animals are not that sexy. <laughs> if you, well, there is a, an example. My professor, he went to uh, <coughs> England, I guess, is where the jaguar cars are made. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. And he took a video, and he invited the guy who was in charge of the grant, and he took it to Corcoal. When they were in Corcoal, they, he, he, he did something that I, I was surprised. He gave the guy a small jaguar, like a, like a, a small cat, and he, he said, if you give me money, you are going to be protecting this animal. And the guy was like <gasps> happy to have this small animal in his hand. But it will be different if I go to <laughs> a to snail. To, to, <laughs> if I go to Costa Rica and I take, I don't know, okay. Greg, Greg. I take Greg, I said, Greg, look, I work with crocodiles. Come with me. <laughs> <laughs> we get into the water and I said, look, there is one. Have, hey, 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 are you going to give me money to protect the animal? No, he's not going to do it. He's going to run away. So it's different. It's different. The thing is that we did the model. And the model showed, showed that there are options. One of the options is expand the corridor to some place to another, to try to get just a small piece of land that could make like a union in these two places, to try to develop a strategy in here where it's like, uh, like a cross between the forest coverage to ensure the movement of the animal, and that is on this line of thinking that goes ahead of the, of the analysis that we just made, that I just pre present. You have to think ahead and what is going to happen. This information is going to lead us to what? You have to have always that. Please never be like, ah, I did that and that's it. Think how this is going to affect the wildlife or you, the species that you are interested in. And it's really important that Sean mention it because your bosses are going to ask you for that. <laughs> okay, you are going to do an analysis. Okay, what's more? What should I do? And you are going to have 
Right? You have to do the decision making. And that is something that you have to value because you are being trained to do decision making. I was saying, Don, yesterday, Don, it's really nice <coughs> that you are training people that have the ability to say what to do. In Costa Rica, we are still training good biologists, very, very good biologists that know a lot of taxonomy, of, of scientific names, of whatever. But when someone asks our biologists, so what should we do? They say, okay, this is the Pantera Onca, this is the <laughs> Crocodilus acutus. But okay, we, what we should do, <coughs> we are not giving them like administrations to like uh, policy economics, and policy. Economics, yeah. And that is one of the things that we have to change. And that's why I'm here, because we want to establish an exchange model in which you can go over there and know our reality and you can value yours. Because sometimes we say, they are not teaching me anything at school. <laughs> this is a piece of whatever you want to <laughs> say. But you, you are not valuing the thing that you are getting here. As our students are not valuing the thing that they are receiving there. Obviously, we are, you are a couple of years ahead, obviously. And that, it, that is normal. But that's why it's important to have all perspective. Because I'm telling you something really, really seriously. If you go to Costa Rica, you're going to get lost because of the amount of trees, of everything. Mm -hmm. it's, it's a completely different place. You're going to have, in some places, more than 200 pergolan snakes per hectare. Are you willing to go that place. Well, we are. We are study there. It's our field. And this is, is your field. But you are, not work, you are not going to be working here for the rest of your life. You may move to some other place. You may move to, to Latin America. You may move to Europe, whatever. And you have to have the experience to do these kind of things. Because you can do this in uh, the Himalayas, or in Costa Rica, or in here. You have to use the tools, but use it. And you don't have to think that it's something mechanical. Make the, the, the <coughs> analysis. You can do that you, in five minutes. If you have the layers, you are going to do it in five minutes. But what the analysis means? What are the decisions that you have to make? That's the main thing. It's not just to make like a map or to build a model. Because to, to do a model is really easy. You have the layers and you click on, <laughs> and you are going to have the model. Th and that was it. But what the <coughs> model means? Remember, well, when I studied, I had uh, a statistics professor that said, you don't have to do the, the giggle. You know the giggle rule is? Garbage in, garbage out. You can fill and a statistics problem with whatever. It's going to give you a result. But is the result correct? Are you managing the variables in a right way? So you are always going to have something. Is that something helpful or useless? That is something that you have to think. And please value the training that you are receiving here because it is going to <laughs> give you an opportunity that many of our students don't have. So for the ones who goes to Costa Rica, it's a pleasure. And with the others that are not going to Costa Rica, <laughs> it is too. Next and year. Next year. And, <laughs> and whenever you want to go to Costa Rica, they have my contacts. So <laughs> I'll help you if you want. And if you want to do your masters over there, okay, you're signing, you're signed here, but you want to do the field job over there, count me in, okay? So 
thank you very much. And if you have something else, just pass it. Let's thank you, Yvonne. That was great. That was great. So if you guys have questions, you guys are welcome to ask questions, but I, but I would just emphasize that fortunately or unfortunately, humans are humans, right? And so I think sometimes we get so caught up in, um, in our differences in culture, or the way we look or whatever, we sometimes think that that place is super different from here. And there are different landscapes and different, different constraints, but the really people are people. Yes. It's the same stuff in the Middle East, South America, whatever. And so, so many of these principles, as we were just discussing, are totally universal, right? So moving someone from a village on the coast to the capital is basically the same challenge you would have here. You can pick somebody up from Oxnard and tell them we're going to move to Sacramento. Like, mm -hmm. what? You know, how's that going to work? So, yeah. so um, one of the things that one of the reasons we travel is to learn about other places, but the other reason we travel is to learn about us and to learn about our home. And, and by that that comparison and contrast, it really helps put stuff in perspective. So great. So, um, questions? Any additional questions about conservation planning or? Yes. Um, you said that